and I hold this company for the next k years, what kind of returns can I get? Right, so that's case number one. So case number two is where you think it's going to, you know, the, the business performance is going to go up like this, but it typically doesn't happen that way. Typically what happens is it goes up a bit, then it's either flat for some time, then it goes up a bit, or it goes up a bit, then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up, right? It's always like a zigzag line. So what happens is at one of these points in this journey, we can end up concluding as an investor that my original thesis is not panning out, right? For example, if we were an investor in Weber Global, an investor in Angel One, an investor in Polymedicure, then what we would see is that at some point that growth stops or slows down, right? One of those two things happen. Even some of the best companies like Diddy's, Loris, and PI Industries have had their growth either slow down or go to degrowth, right? Now here is the thing. If it's a good company and the growth is slowing down, then certainly an investor who has a less propensity for action will either do nothing or they will buy, right? So all of these, so this is the business cycle, but if you're plotting the stock price, it would be like this, and then maybe down like this, right? And then maybe it stabilizes a bit. Because they, it's both hyperbolic discounting and then hyperbolic discounting in the other direction. It's always, you know, market takes it to the extreme on either side. So the point is, it, a long term or a buy and hold investor would basically buy the dip here, buy the dip, right? The problem with buying the dip though is twofold. Number one, you have to be very, very sure that the company I'm buying the dip in, when I say the dip, I mean the dip in the business, not the price. The company I'm buying the dip in is really a good quality company and that the cycle will turn and the company will do it, right? I think that's also a lot of assumptions and a lot of hypothesis that you're putting in. And that's okay for someone to do if they have a lot of experience in the market, if they have two decades, three decades of experience, they have seen things enough to take that view. But especially for young investors, I think that's much harder. And it sort of would be a little bit arrogant to think that I can predict that this company will do well even in the up cycle and you know, others won't do better and it will gain market share, not lose market share and all of that, right? So the point is at this point, investor has two choices. One is that I will be a buy the dip kind of uh, investor and a buy and hold investor. So they buy the dip. The other option that typically a young investor would end up taking is to exit, right? Exit or sort of sell. The reason for selling is if my thesis has broken down, the company is not growing the way I thought it will grow. Then there are always other opportunities. You know, there are like 5,000 listed companies. I think from the con calls I have read at least 100 of them guide for more than 20% growth, right? If there are 100 companies, I still have to narrow them down to 15 to 20 that I own, right? There's always enough and more companies that are guiding for 20% growth that we should try to find where the probability of outcomes is higher and in our favor and where the valuation is also in our favor, right? So this is the second case where again, because of a breakdown in thesis, Generally, some investors at least will end up selling. The jury, in my opinion, is still out on which of the two investors will do better, right? At least in the short term, it will always seem like the investor who's churning will do better. Anecdotal evidence does suggest that high churn strategies have better XIRR. That is what even quant research suggests. Another anecdotal evidence, if you look at any of the super investors, especially when they were younger, they definitely did churn a lot. And when we say churn, we are not saying that they would churn everything, but at least the low conviction or the smaller positions, they did churn a lot. For example, people will always give the example of, you know, Warren Buffett's Coca-Cola investment, but then we have to look when Warren Buffett was managing $1 million, right? When he went in 1950s and 60s. At that point, his churn was much higher. Similarly, if you look at Rakesh Junjunwala sir, we can always look at Titan and say, oh, see, it became 40-50% of his net worth. The point is, is this one Titan though, right? This maybe one more Chrysal. And then other companies, he did churn. So that's the important thing. 
we should definitely know when to churn and when not to churn as well. So then let's come to the third case. So the third case is where the company does well, the business is going up and the stock price also does well and the stock price is going up and it does not do any kind of you know hyperbolic discounting kind of stuff meaning that the valuation doesn't go up right this is the ideal case for buy and hold the point is very few companies actually exhibit this among the ones i own either the thesis breaks down or there is a lot of hyperbolic discounting and as an investor you are forced to think of future risk reward and thus so so you know without i mean anything being a buy and sell recommendation just for the purpose of sharing knowledge RACL is one such company where you know the business has been growing at 30% or so and the stock price has also been growing at a similar rate and then you know, the valuation even today might be something like 28 to 30 times trailing 12 month earnings but if you look at the next 12 months then it more, might be more like 20 to 22 times earnings right so it's never too expensive and thus you are never sort of tempted to sell it. Whereas with other companies where there is a much higher hyperbolic discounting, you are always thinking, you know, is this the right time to sell? This is the right time to sell. So one of the uh, criticisms of selling early or selling on valuation or high churn that I hear is that how will you know when to come back and you know, can you even come back? So again, I want to give just one quick anecdotal example. For example, you know, the company here is Angel One. It's a broker and it's actually gaining market share from other brokers. Right. Angel One, when I had initially bought it was around 500 to 600 rupees, right? It started somewhere here. Then it sort of went up to 2000, started coming down. By the time it reached 1700, that is where the first fundamental negative or bad update came. And one could see that there is a loss in business momentum happening, right? Immediately when that happened, I sold, right? So it was still a pretty good return, but the point is at this point and this point, the risk reward were very different. This point, it was maybe something like 15 to uh, 10 to 15 times earnings. At this point though, it was more like 25 to 30 times earnings, right? Earnings had not gone up that much. All of this might have happened in like 1 to 1.5 years, right? The price had run up a lot. The valuation was not in our favor, right? At that point, it, it would be unreasonable and irrational to hold the company. So I sold it at that point, right? Then what happened? Over the course of the next year or so, it came down to like 1100 rupees or so roughly. But importantly, the multiple came down even more. The multiple now is like 10 to 12 X earnings. And the reason for that is because the entire, you know, stock market broker, the stock market and brokers both lost momentum in business. And because of that, the derating has happened and the whole narrative around brokers being cyclical all that is playing out but if you look at the data if you look at the nse uh, fno volume charts you will see that you know nse fno volume basically keeps increasing exponentially even right now and nse actually publishes like a daily update on this so every day you can check out how much index option volumes were traded on that day so you know i don't think there's a, a slowdown happening so this is the primary reason why I thought now the risk reward is in my favor and now I can buy it, right? So I saved myself some amount of time correction, some amount of price correction. Most importantly, the risk reward is far better because now it's like 10 to 12 times earnings and 3 to 4% dividend yield, right? So, so my point is, as long as we are willing to be rational, as long as we are willing to see the stock as just a vehicle for compounding, so it's important to be in the market. It's not that important what vehicle we are using. As long as we are willing to be rational both in the entry and the exit and the subsequent re-entry, I think we do okay. So even today, my expectation from Angel is that in the next three to four years, the price might you know uh, sufficiently reflect the compounding of the earnings and then you know if a bull market happens then the valuation can go back to some of the previous valuations which is why i think it makes a lot of sense to own it as a broker so i think uh, through these, these examples i wanted to show that you know uh, buy and hold is very very difficult if you are keeping a hawk eye 
on the business momentum as well as the valuation and the risk reward.